It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this special Zoom meeting from the Weizmann Institute of Science. We are very happy that so many of you were able to be with us today. The discussion we are about to have focuses on something that is important to every one of us, the recent creation of different vaccines against the coronavirus, which were designed in record time. This is, this is a triumph for science and medicine, a reason for hope, and it's also a great story. At the end of the talk, you will, be have, you will have an opportunity to have your question answered by our expert. You can submit your question at any time via the chat box, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. The Q&A sessions will be managed by Carol Perelman Fastlit from Mexico. Carol is a chemist and alumna of the Weizmann Institute Bessie Lawrence International Summer Camp. Together with the members of the Mexican Association, Carol funded the Weizmann Science Garden in Mexico City, as well as the Vera Weizmann Group for Women in Science in Mexico. Before we begin, I would like to thank those who made this meeting possible, particularly our associations of friends in many countries, especially in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Canada, and UK. A special thanks also goes to Raquel Sibova and Andrea Schweka here at the Weizmann Institute for helping organize this event. I would like to introduce our speakers today. Professor Gabriel Barabash is the former Director General Emeritus of Israel, Israel's Minister of Health. A physician, he is a professor at the Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University and is also a former CEO of Tel Aviv Suraski Medical Center. Professor Barabash is the director of the Weizmann Institute Bench to Bedside program, which promotes collaboration between scientists and clinical experts. Today, we are honored to have him here with us to give us some perspective on where things stand and what can expect in the future. Professor Igor Ulitsky is a faculty member in the Department of Biological Regulation. He studies long non-coding RNAs, a type of genetic material which he calls some of the least accessible chapters in the book of DNA. New vaccines for COVID-19 were developed using RNA technology, and Professor Ulitsky will give us the scientific backstory about the special role of RNA placed in these vaccines. And now I would like to hand the microphone over to the only physicist here tonight, Professor Roy Oseri, our Vice President for Resource Development. Please, Roy. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, thank you, Gabi, and thank you, Igor, for taking the time uh, so late in the night here in Israel to join us and give, give us your insight about the situation and about the science behind um, RNA vaccines. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, we, all, we all went through a, a non-simple year and I think we're still, we're still in the midst of that. And you know, speaking for me personally, this is the first pandemic that, that I'm, I'm living through. And of course, for all of us, it's a very new situation. But if you think about it, Pandemics and plagues have been around since the dawn of history, um, you know, not starting, but certainly through the 10 plagues uh, in Egypt, all through the Middle Ages with, with the Black Death, and even in the 20th century, the Spanish flu. And I think that throughout most of history, mankind really stood helpless in the face of these huge pandemics. And, you know, there was very little that people could do in order to stop it. And I think we're now witnessing really history in the making in the sense that we're seeing the first pandemic that science was actually able, hopefully, to stop in its tracks. Um, and this is certainly due to the very rapid evolution of, of scientific firepower and our ability to understand the very basic principles behind the virus, the very you know, chemical and, and uh, physical structure of the virus that allows uh, people like Igor, scientists around the world to come up with very quick and fast and efficient um, uh, ways to mitigate the way the, the virus works. 
I think it's a huge triumph uh, for science. Uh, Gabi will correct me if it's too early to call this a triumph, but that's, that's certainly uh, the feeling that I have. And, and it really makes you ponder about the role that science has uh, in our society. Um, when you start from curiosity-driven uh, research and your desire to understand the basic mechanisms behind life, behind the universe, behind physics and chemistry and math, and the tools that you generate eventually allow mankind to, uh, to be able to stop and mitigate uh, pandemic situations like this. I think it's a, it's a great example of our role in, as scientists in society. And, and to be honest, it makes me proud to be part of the scientific family. And I think all of you as supporters of science, as supporters of scientific endeavor and as supporters of scientific institutions uh, should, feel, should feel proud together with me. So um, with that, um, I'd like to use that opportunity to thank uh, all of you, in particular, those of you who supported the Weizmann Institute uh, Corona Response Fund. I think that stepping up to the challenge uh, like this uh, was a very generous, noble, and timely, timely step. And I think it's a very good opportunity to say thank you. Um, and with that, I would like um, to hand the microphone over to Igor, who would now uh, tell us about the basic principles uh, behind the pandemic. Thank you, Ori. So I'll show you some slides. And so first of all, as Ori mentioned, the, uh, there's a lot of hope and a lot of stakes in the, in the vaccines. And one way to illustrate what Ori was talking about is this chart from Science Magazine from a short while back which is uh, showing uh, several decades back from the 1950s, a variety of different infectious diseases that has really um, had a huge impact on human society. So this is measles, for example, and the size of the circle is proportional to how many people got measles in the United States in the, in the 50s. And the colored circles are, uh, indicate the time at which uh, vaccines were uh, developed for uh, these diseases. And we can see that vaccines really had a drastic impact and uh, allowed uh, humanity to completely eradicate some of the diseases, which really would affect and infect um, hundreds of thousands of individuals, um, both in the US and of course, throughout the world. So we don't know yet how effective the new vaccines are going to be, but there is certainly the, the stakes are high and the hopes are very high and um, that uh, we will get a, a real um, solution to the pandemic that we're facing. And all of these different vaccines for the variety of different uh, infectious diseases are all based on the same principle. And the principle is that healthy people that haven't encountered the virus yet are inoculated with a sample from the virus. This is particularly a sample which allows the cells to recognize typically one or few specific proteins that the virus has. In the case of the coronavirus, this is the spike protein a spike-shaped protein found on the membrane of the coronavirus, which is used to recognize our, uh, the cells in our body. Specifically, most of the vaccines are developed to target a specific region within that spike, which is the region which is touching and recognizing the receptor on human cells and allows the virus to enter the body. So the idea is that once we're immunized with, uh, um, with this protein, the immune system of the body will learn it, will recognize it, and then if we are exposed to the virus later on, the immune system will no longer consider it something new. It will uh, be able to recognize it, ideally to neutralize it, and to prevent it from either infecting us or from causing any kind of detectable disease. So the idea behind the vaccine is to introduce a way through which the body will now be able to express this particular spike protein from the coronavirus. And when researchers are considering how they can uh, make this happen, how they can introduce this spike protein, they're following the so-called central dogma of molecular biology, which we know for decades already. And that is that information in living cells is encoded typically in the form of DNA DNA is a very stable molecule, it's a fixed molecule, and all the vaccines are generally designed not to affect the DNA in the human cells, but they can potentially introduce transiently DNA, which will be used to produce the viral protein. 
the DNA within cells is copied into another kind of molecule, which is called an RNA molecule, or specifically a messenger RNA molecule. And this molecule is much more transient. This molecule is then translated into a protein and proteins carry out many functions in the cell. In the specific case of the vaccine, we would like the protein to be presented to the exposed by the cell to the immune system. So with this general blueprint in mind, the vaccines can work on different levels. So they can introduce the DNA of the spike protein into the cell, they can introduce the RNA, or they can introduce the protein product. So if we think about the kinds of vaccines that are being now actively developed or being approved in some countries, we can divide them conceptually into four groups. So the first group are cases where a coronavirus is used and this virus is inactivated or attenuated in different forms. So there are various approaches which can be used for it. And this is, as I'll also mention later, the more, most traditional way to make a vaccine. Right now, there are two vaccines from Sinovac and Sinopharm, which are developed and approved for use in China and are beginning to, unroll, to be approved in additional countries as well, as well as a Covaxin from, the, um, from India, which is also now in uh, advanced uh, stages of, uh, uh, of testing in India. Another uh, idea is instead of using a coronavirus vaccine, which as, as, as we will uh, discuss later, has some safety potential safety implications to it, is to use a different virus, to take a virus which can infect human cells, but typically does not cause any kind of a severe disease in humans or can be further engineered to not cause any disease by itself. And within this alternative virus, scientists can, ex can introduce a piece of DNA which would encode the spike protein of the coronavirus. So instead of using uh, some kind of an inactivated coronavirus vector, another viral vector is, uh, is being used. This uh, idea is used in the form of an adenovirus as an alternative uh, virus uh, by the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is approved for use in the UK and is now being rolled out in additional countries as well. In a Sputnik V vaccine, which has been developed in Russia, in the CanSino vaccine developed in China, and in the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, which is in advanced uh, stages of testing uh, in the US. I should mention that a similar idea is also used in a vaccine developed by the Israeli uh, Institute for Biology. It's still only in phase two testing, and it's using a different viral vector, but the general idea is the same. So in the case of these vaccines, the DNA encoding the spike protein is encapsulated in a different virus. In most cases, this is an adenovirus. And because some of us have been exposed in the past to, uh, to adenovirus, uh, different uh, um, developers have used different uh, tricks in order to use an adenovirus that most of us have not been exposed to before. So either uh, adenovirus that typically infects uh, pr other primates or a combination of two different adenoviruses in the case of, uh, of Sputnik V. This DNA is packaged into the virus. The virus is infecting our cells Within the cells, it is injecting the DNA into the nucleus of the cell. Within the cell, the DNA is producing an RNA, and then the RNA is translated, spike protein is produced and presented on the membrane of the vaccinated cell. And from this point on, the immune system now learns how to recognize uh, the spike protein. A different idea is instead of introducing a virus into the cell, to directly introduce into the cells the RNA itself, specifically the messenger RNA, which would encode the spike protein. This idea is newer. It is used in the Pfizer and BioNTech uh, vaccine and the Moderna vaccines, both of which have been uh, approved by uh, the FDA. The Pfizer vaccine is now extensively uh, used in uh, Israel. The Moderna vaccine is quite extensively used in the US. And there is at least one additional company uh, uh, from actually from, from Germany that is now in advanced uh, stages of uh, testing an RNA vaccine. Here, the idea is simpler. We don't have a virus. We just have a layer of lipids, which is encapsulating an RNA molecule encoding the spike. Again, this is a more transient uh, molecule and no carrier here is used, which is, which is a virus by itself. This uh, uh, vesicle is fusing with the target cell the RNA is introduced directly into the cells, translated, 
spike proteins are produced. And from that point on, it acts as any other kind of vaccine. The fourth type of vaccines are the protein vaccines. These are skipping all the, st the stages of the DNA or the RNA and directly introducing the body, the proteins. This is a bit, this idea is conceptually simple. In practice, it is somewhat more challenging because our immune system doesn't just need to see the protein, it needs to see the protein in a particular context where it will be recognized as something that the immune system needs to learn about. So this requires some additional tricks. The most advanced vaccine from this group is coming from a US company called Novavax. It is currently in advanced stages of testing in the UK and, and the US. Sanofi, a, a big pharmaceutical company from France was also developing this kind of vaccine but they stopped for now. And there is a Russian vaccine also in the form of a protein that uh, unfortunately we don't know a lot of details about, but it has been approved in Russia as well. So importantly, th this is just a sample of the uh, vaccines that are currently either approved in some countries or are in very advanced stages of testing. Behind them, there is a large wave of over 200 different vaccine candidates which are being developed. And this is from Nature Magazine from, from yesterday actually, but you can see that these additional 200 plus vaccines are mostly coming from the same groups that I mentioned earlier. So conceptually, they're similar. Some of them are probably better than this first wave of vaccines, but there is going to be a substantial a challenge for the world to uh, test these vaccines and compare them to vaccines that are already out there because some of the vaccines that are out there are already quite effective. So any additional approvals will require to show that this additional wave is at least as effective and this might be potentially quite challenging. So if we compare the technologies, I will again go through these one by one. So the simplest and the most traditional technology is an inactivated or an attenuated uh, uh, COVID-19 virus. The advantage of this is that this is the most tested and most uh, um, well understood way of vaccination. It is developed primarily right now, the leading uh, vaccines in this group are from China and, uh, and India. It appears to be quite effective and it's reported to be safe, but we don't have a, a lot of information about it from uh, scientific literature. The price of it is also not very clear. There are some reports from China that it's quite expensive, but how much it actually costs the countries that are buying it, it's, uh, at least I couldn't find any information. It should be relatively easy to produce at high capacity, relatively easy to store, and potentially can be used more than once. The second group, are the adenovirus-based vaccines. This is the Oxford and AstraZeneca, the Sputnik vaccines. This technology is relatively newer, but it has been used in several uh, vaccination efforts before, in particular in Ebola vaccines developed and used in recent years. There are various reports here on efficacy, mostly from the Oxford trial, which unfortunately was a quite complicated trial with many different arms and several uh, technical problems so we're, we can't be completely sure at this point about the efficacy. It is somewhere between 70%, although AstraZeneca is claiming that if you look at the numbers in a certain way, it can be a, as high as 95%. It appears to have relatively rare uh, side effects. This trial was stopped in the US at some point because of, of a particular type of inflammation, but it does appear to be quite rare. The big advantage of these vaccines is that they're relatively cheap and they can be produced at very large scale. So the, the kind of vaccine that the, the whole world really needs is uh, likely this Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine because billions of it can be produced within the near few months. It's relatively easy to um, transport. It does have, as I mentioned, the issue of uh, problems in terms of using this vaccine more than once because it uses this adenovirus uh, encapsulation. After a, a single administration or maybe after, uh, after two or three of these, the body will eventually develop antibodies that will recognize the adenovirus. And then this kind of vaccine cannot be used anymore because it will not be effective anymore. The body will learn to how to neutralize uh, uh, the adenovirus. The third group is the, is the RNA technology. It is newer. The first RNA vaccines which have been approved in the world are the vaccines for uh, COVID-19. But there have been several hundreds of people that have been enrolled in trials for other RNA vaccines over the past two or three years. But, it, but we, we don't know how safe this vaccine is over longer term, even though theoretically we don't expect to have any particular problems because as I mentioned, RNA as a molecule is overall quite transient. 
these vaccines uh, appear to be very effective. They appear to have very uh, few side effects, and these are typically very short-term side effects. But again, this is a relatively new technology on the other hand. They're quite expensive. They're uh, as much as 10 times more exp expensive than the adenovirus vaccines. And because this is a new technology, their scale of production is quite limited. It is only expected that about 2 billion doses of these vaccines will be produced next year. And every one of them requires two doses. So they will only be available to about a billion uh, people. They're much more complicated to store and transport, particularly the Pfizer vaccine requires to be most of the time at minus 80 degrees. This is very challenging. And at least theoretically, on the other hand, we will be able to use them more than once. So if new mutations arise, these vaccines can be relatively easily adapted and re-administered if necessary, but again, with the limitation of the scale of production. The fourth group are the protein vaccines. There are some traditional protein vaccines, but overall, most of the ideas used by the leading companies are quite new. No trials have, have finished with these protein vaccines yet, so we don't quite know uh, the, um, how effective or how safe they are. We do know the price tag, which is somewhere between RNA and adenovirus. And we know that these can be produced at quite high scale, but again, there are still many unknowns here. And I'll just end as an RNA biologist, one of the reasons we're really excited about these vaccine developments, and in particular about uh, uh, development of RNA vaccines, is because we think that this opens uh, the age of RNA therapeutics. So uh, vaccines are just one place in medicine where the introduction of RNA into cells can be, uh, can be advantageous. Other cases are in, in, the, in the context of cancer, where we would like to develop vaccines for specific mutations which arise in cancer cells, or in the context of different human diseases, where there is a deficiency in a particular protein. And again, an RNA can be used to supplement uh, the cells and to induce production of a protein that, that is missing. And all the advantages which we're seeing with the, this really very rapid development of RNA vaccines are available for, for these technologies. There are also several challenges and advantages and uh, uh, challenges that will have to be uh, met, in particular, the ability to deliver this RNA to a large number of cells and the fact that introduction of RNA uh, into cells does lead to some immune response. Fortunately, in the context of, uh, of vaccines, both of these challenges are relatively minor because we don't really need to deliver the RNA to a very large number of cells. And the fact that there is some immune response is actually advantageous. So with this, I'll end and I'll hand over um, uh, to Gabi, which will talk more about the clinical side of these vaccines. Good evening to everyone. Thank you, Igor. Uh, I'd like to focus in my short talk about the corona vaccines that are relevant now, that are in the market now, and their impact on, the, on our future. Let me start with the efficacy of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. The original FDA threshold prerequisite to the pharma companies developing the new vaccines was 60 to 70% immunity. Both Pfizer and Moderna achieved significantly higher success rate. After the first dose, about 50% of the people vaccinated were immune. And after the second dose, 95 were immune. In our sweetest dreams, we didn't believe we will get such a high efficacy of 95%. And obviously, I think these vaccines are a highly potent tool to stop the pandemic. There are two questions I am frequently being asked. One is how strong is the protective immunity after natural infection as compared with vaccination? Uh, we expect that the vaccines will lead to longer and stronger immunity than natural infections. That is true because it in initiates a more comprehensive response from the immune system. The second question is, how long will immunity last following the vaccination? And here I have to say there are four mild coronaviruses that cause common colds, and the immune system, our immune system, only remembers how to deal with them for less than a year. By contrast, immunity against the deadlier coronaviruses, which cause MERS and SARS, lasts for several years. We believe that the immunity against COVID-19 may not last a lifetime, and we will probably need to give a booster vaccine every few years. Talking about safety of these vaccines, we need to mention at least one vaccine side effect of the, corona, of the Moderna and the Pfizer, 
which is the allergic reaction, are one of the most serious side effects of the Pfizer's and Corona vaccine or, and, 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 and Moderna is the allergy. And we have our uh, records for now is that it happens in one in 200 vaccines, 200,000 vaccines. One vaccinated person out of 200 vaccinated people is going to suffer from allergic, severe allergic reaction. And when you compare that to other vaccines like uh, common cold, it is one out of more than a million vaccinated persons. So currently the indication is that only people who have experienced anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, people who usually carry uh, EpiPen uh, injection with them, should not take the vaccine. Other in allergies are allowed to take the vaccine with no, no concern. Um, there are, I would like to mention here, two questions for which we do not yet have an answer. One is, does the vaccine prevent asymptomatic disease and transmission of the virus? We do know that vaccines prevent disease, but we do not know yet if the vaccines also prevent transmission. It is possible that even after getting immune by the vaccine, it allows the virus to harbor in your upper respiratory airways and thus making you an asymptomatic carrier getting infected and infecting other. This is why masks will be mandated even after the vaccination. The second question is, what level of herd immunity is necessary to limit the spread of the virus in the population? Originally, we were thinking about 60 to 70% of the population being vaccinated. However, with the latest British and South African variants with their high transmission capabilities, we are not sure anymore. And we may need to achieve a 90% herd immunity, which is a very high uh, threshold to achieve. Uh, I would like to tell you a few minutes uh, about the British and South African variants because in a way they signify for all of us what the future of race between vaccination and uh, mutation is going to look like. These are two independent but coincidence, coincidental events where the virus had modified, creating new variants which are displacing the original versions in both the UK and South Africa. We are evaluating new variants of the coronavirus in three aspects or characteristics. One is transmissibility, how infectious is the new version? And clearly the new variants are doing a lot better and are 50 more contagious. And also apparently they are more contagious among children. The second characteristic is their virulence. Do they cause a more severe or deadly disease? As far as we know, and people are looking at this closely, other than growing and spreading fast, uh, there is no evidence that they cause more severe disease. And the last and important characteristic is can the new variants de de develop vaccine resistance? And the answer to that is most probably negative. The mutations of the new variants code only a small part of the spike protein, while the response of our immune system as a result of the vaccine is much more comprehensive. However, the virus continues to mutate and I can see a situation where eventually it forces us to develop a new vaccine that will ev efficiently take care of the new variants. I believe that each nation must established a large scale nationwide system for checking coronavirus, coronavirus genomes as possibly more dangerous variants may be on the horizon. If there is another dangerous variant, we need to know when it crops up. To sum up, although this is indeed 
as we said, a huge scientific triumph, this pandemic is not going to disappear in the near future. I believe it is most probably going to stay with us as an indolent viral disease some years from now with restrictions that will remain in place. More stringent restrictions during travel from one country to the other and the masks and all the social distancing at least for a year from now, even if we get vaccinated uh, in several nations. When the virus, this virus is somewhere in the world, it is everywhere in the world. That is something that we have learned and this is going to guide our behavior also with the vaccines for the next, I think, two, three years. Thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Barbash and Professor Ulitsky for your enlightening and very clear presentations. Uh, I would like to thank all of you in the webinar that sent us so many questions, so many interesting questions. We have received so many that I would like, I would try to get most of them, but I would like to start with a question from the UK, from Deborah Gondel. Uh, Deborah wants to know uh, about the importance of vaccinating Black, Asian, and minority uh, minority communities, and what measures can be done to encourage them to agree to be vaccinated. Shall I refer to that? I think uh, we have, we do not have that huge problem in Israel as we see uh, with minorities in the US. However, we have a small sample of that with the ultra-Orthodox and Arab populations. And with the ultra-Orthodox, we have a simple answer because they have the rabbis and they, when, what they say, they do. With the Arab population, it needs a lot of con convince, convincing them using leaders of this population in order to convince, uh, convince them to do that. Give an example. This is the only way uh, we can, I think we can, uh, and, and also one more thing, using in the media representatives of this um, uh, population, explaining to the population what is behind the vaccine and so on using them to explain to their own people, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, then there is a question from Barbara Kolodi from Canada. She would like to ask about children under 16, the pediatric population, uh, about getting the vaccines. Nowadays, all the vaccines are, have been authorized to population over 16. So uh, anything for the under 16? Yeah. The the, currently, there are studies done over, uh, the, first of all, the vaccines that were, that were released were released from age of 16. Now there are currently studies done, there are more than 20 cities in the US where they are doing uh, a clinical trial with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines with the ages of 12 to 16. No trials, to my knowledge, are below that age of 12. However, we need to remember and, and take into account that you cannot uh, control epidemic in that magnitude when you leave such a big crowd within the population. I'm talking about kids below 12 that are not vaccinated. And we eventually, I know there are talks about that in the FDA currently, on this issue, uh, I think when we all get more confidence with the vaccines, we will be more re relaxed to allow examining it in uh, younger ages too. Okay, thank you. Yes, mostly because of what you said of the variants, no, that are yeah. being more yeah. contagious probably in the, okay. Then, um, 
What is your opinion on the new ideas of changing the protocol approved for the vaccines in order to get more people vaccinated sooner? There is this idea in the UK to delay the second dose, the, the booster. Then there's the idea, this idea in the US to uh, give half of the Moderna vaccine. So, and also the idea of mix and match, no? starting with one vaccine and if there is not av availability for the second dose of the same company, then using another approved one. So what are your, uh, your opinion about those, those ideas? You go, shall I? Or you? Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, scientifically, there is only one way to go. You follow the clinical trial by which these vaccines were approved. And doing other options, even if they look logical to you, uh, mixing vaccines or delaying the doses is hampering with the uh, potential, the immune potential of the vaccines. We do not recommend that. The FDA do not recommend that. And there is a criticism in the UK about those decisions that they took. I think, um, no, I will stop here. I, I, I can add that there is now a trial, I think, being conducted between AstraZeneca and, and Sputnik about, about mixing. And yeah, then the, this is somewhat of a controversial topic in a sense, because on one hand, it hasn't been completely, uh, it hasn't been tested. And I think that, that that's eventually uh, the answer, even though theoretically there, there are reasons to think that it should probably be okay to delay and it should probably be okay to, to, to mix. But because it hasn't been tested uh, at all, and because some of these technologies are still uh, relatively very new technologies, it is advised not to do that. Exactly. Okay. Then uh, Mario Fleck from Brazil, he, he would like to know, um, uh, he says, now we do not have a precise understanding on the origin of the pandemic in China. Therefore, how can we, we be sure it would not happen again? So I think it's true that we, we don't have a very clear understanding and, and the World Health Organization is trying to, to figure that out. And uh, so far the Chinese government has not been very, uh, very helpful. But I, th I think we know that we, we know for a long time that viruses will occasionally cross from, uh, from animals into humans. That is something that does happen all the time. It happens with influenza all the time. And coronaviruses that, that have been with us for, uh, for some time have also um, um, crossed into the human population probably a hundred plus years ago. Actually, there is I think, an, um, I think it's called the Chinese flu in, in the late 19th century, which is now believed to be the event where one of the now common cold coronaviruses crossed into the population. So we, it is expected that these kind of events will happen in the future. Luckily, the technologies that are now being used and which were really rolled out in, in record time, hopefully will be even more effective next time that, uh, that this comes around. But, but humanity has to, uh, to expect that these kind of events will uh, occur in the future as well as they have occurred for centuries before. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jerry Cole from the USA, he wants to know how Israel is organized. How do you know uh, which, in which group you are and where are you in that list to get vaccinated? Uh, uh, each citizen has to call their doctors or pharmacists or how do you know where to go? So Israel is, uh, is built in, the healthcare system in Israel is, uh, is built in a different way as compared to the US. It is more closely related to the EU social democratic system. So we have four HMOs in Israel and they are uh, ensuring all citizens in Israel. And they have a list with uh, names and telephone numbers and every, you know, all the records, the clinical records of all their members in the HMO. And they get instructions from the government, which group to vaccinate first, which group to vaccinate second and so on. And they summon or ask the, the members of the HMO to call 
and or, or launch into one of the internet sites and register for vaccination. They have, uh, you know, many clinics distributed all over Israel, and they also build some centers of vaccination. So everyone get connected through his uh, uh, HMO, uh, get a date and uh, an hour where he goes to and get vaccinated by the team of the uh, HMO. Uh, special areas like uh, uh, old, you know, senior people and so on are getting vaccinated by Magen David Adom, which is like the Red Cross. They go there and vaccinate the people there. So we are lucky that we have this public health system in Israel that goes from tertiary care to primary care and until, you know, as, as you go to the last patient, yeah. Yes, it's incredible. The speed you're, you're getting in Israel. Um, the, there is a question here about patients with some form of immunodeficiency or autoimmune disease. So which vaccine do you think they should get if they should get a vaccine? Okay, so the answer here is as follows. The only limitation uh, from getting vaccinated are people who had anaphylactic shock. Usually those people go with EpiPen. All those people with uh, immunocompromised diseases from cancer to rheumatoid arthritis or other diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, or other diseases that necessitate treating with chemotherapy or uh, steroids and so on, can be vaccinated with no concern, no fear. The only question we have with these patients is not any danger to them from the vaccine, but there is a possibility that the vaccine is not going to work that good in these patients because of their immune compromise system. But they shouldn't fear to get vaccine, but they should be aware that the vaccine may not work as well as it worked with other people. Okay, then the next question comes uh, very logical. Uh, how do you measure if the population is being immune to the COVID-19 after the vaccination? So this is part of the agreement that was signed with the government of Israel and Pfizer. We we are uh, we have because we have the data through the HMOs. Every patient, everyone that is getting vaccinated has his details in the HMO that he was vaccinated. I was vaccinated today, like an hour after I was vaccinated, I got a message, you know, an SMS in my uh, iPhone. You are vaccinated and you are approved and so on. So all of this is registered. Now, if by, by chance I'm getting infected or getting hospitalized for, because of Corona or other things, not, doesn't matter. The data, the, the, the data about my uh, disease or my hospitalization is immediately with the HMO. And we have the data on all the patients that were vaccinated. We know what happened with them. If uh, we know today, out of the one and 1.5 million citizens that were vaccinated, we know who got infected between the first dose and the second dose, and what was the kind of infection, was he hospitalized and so on. So all of these data we know, and it allows us to appreciate the impact of the vaccination. And that is the important data that is important also to Pfizer and Moderna to understand when you vaccinate a population like Israel, what are the impacts, clinical, economic, and so on? Exactly, that's phase four. Yep. Okay, so then there is this question uh, from Brazil, from Sergio Losinski. Uh, Brazil is about to approve a Chinese vaccine that nobody knows anything about it. Test result figures were not clearly presented. It's called CoronaVac. Do you know something about it? We are more than 200 million people down here, so this is a crucial situation. Probably Professor Ulitsky. So, so CoronaVac is in, uh, one of the in inactivated uh, uh, virus vaccines, which I think, again, we can only speak theoretically because there hasn't been, I, I haven't seen any, any released data, there, there might have been, but this is the most traditional way of vaccination. So most childhood vaccines that we're taking, and Gabby can correct me if I'm wrong, are, are, are inactivated viruses. And in, from the standpoint of uh, 
in, in induction of immunity, uh, an inactivated virus has a lot of uh, advantages in that it is presenting the spike protein in its most native and most sort of natural form. So all the other ideas of introducing the RNA or introducing the proteins, they're all bypasses that are trying to mimic as well as possible the presentation of the spike protein that the coronavirus itself obviously does the best. So there are clear advantages and reasons that this has been the most uh, uh, um, traditional way of, pre of, of preparing vaccines. The, the, downs, the potential downside could be safety where there have been sort of with, with polio vaccines and so on, there have been a variety of, of uh, cases in the past, but generally these are relatively uh, 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 traditional and safe approach it has been used, I think, quite extensively in, uh, in China. And I think we, we can rely on, on the incentives of, of, of the Chinese company and Chinese government in general, not to release something to the world that is not, uh, that they, they deem to have suspicions about, uh, about safety and so on. Uh, and, it, and, and the reports about sort of other uh, vaccines from this type from, from Sinopharm has generally shown that it is effective, I think, in uh, United Arab Emirates and, and in Turkey. And there is an ongoing trial in Brazil. Uh, so so, so it, it's true that the, the scale, once it's enrolled, is much larger than the scale in, in the trials. But sort of certainly there are uncertainties, but there isn't any particular a priori reason to be particularly concerned about this vaccine. Nothing that we are aware of. Thank you, Professor. Um, now, there are many questions regarding who should get vaccinated. Like, for example, uh, if someone had COVID-19, when should you get the vaccine? Um, there is a divergence of opinions here. In Israel, those who had uh, COVID-19 are not vaccinated. In the US, they do, as much as they do. They do vaccine. Uh, people who were sick with COVID-19. I, I mentioned in my talk that the vaccine uh, gives you, apparently it looks like we believe it gives you a, a better immunity than the disease itself. So I personally recommend whoever can be vaccinated to be vaccinated regardless whether he had or didn't have COVID-19. Excellent. And then for pregnant uh, or women that would like to get pregnant, would you recommend the vaccine? I do. Uh, you have to understand, we do not have data on pregnant women, women except for the uh, few tens of women that got pregnant without knowing when they got the vaccine in the Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, but the American College of Gynecology immediately when uh, FDA approved the, modern, uh, the Pfizer uh, vaccine, uh, recommended the, that pregnant women are going to be vaccinated. And we do that in Israel now. Not only pregnant, but also nursing mothers uh, can get the vaccine with no, cons no, no worry. Excellent. And then uh, going back to uh, autoimmune diseases about multiple sclerosis, people with multiple sclerosis, is it okay with the vaccine? I, I would recommend to consult with a neurologist. I think they are allowed to be vaccinated, but I would recommend consulting with their neurologist. Exactly. Then there is a question about schools. What do you think about opening schools? Uh, for example, I can talk about Mexico. Mexico have had schools closed since the beginning of the pandemic, since March. So, and I know Israel, you've been uh, going on and off uh, schools. What do you think about schools? This is a hot topic. Very, I mean, people are fighting on that like for their life. They are, you know, the whole, the, the whole Corona business, the whole Corona affair is became like a religion. People take one side and believe in that no matter what you, what you show them, and the other people on the other side believe the completely opposite, and you can convince anyone, but by any any uh, any evidence that you bring. Uh, my belief, and that's why I, I made that uh, introduction. My belief is that children are getting infected uh, and are transmitting the infection, although they are not sick, or they they are very little sick, and they are becoming a reservoir where because of their being infected and infecting, they are 
um, strengthening the epidemic. And you cannot open the schools in presence of high um, um, disease viral rate. Circulation. The viral circulating in the, in the population. There is no way to do that. So that's my belief. Some people will kill me for, the, for saying that. So. Okay. I th I think uh, then I, I think. Just to add, to add to that, I think uh, in terms of sort of what happens once the viral population uh, uh, is all vaccinated, that's still very much an open question. And there are several parameters that we just don't know, in particular, how well the vaccines are protecting, not against the disease, but against infection. And this will very much determine what the world will, will look like after uh, the viral population is, is vaccinated. We also don't know so all the, the 95% or 80%, this is in the trial. In the real world, these percentages might be different. And this will also determine what the world will look like uh, in a few, few months from now. It's very hard to answer. Okay, so Professor uh, Olitsky, I think this one is for you. Uh, we want to know um, if you can analyze the security data about Sputnik vaccine, the Russian vaccine. So I think there, there was released, uh, they released only the data about uh, phase one and two, and this generally seemed to yes. be uh, to be uh, reasonable and, and similar to uh, um, to the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca. In terms of again, the, the, the basic principle is very similar to Oxford AstraZeneca. They use an adenovirus. The difference is that Oxford AstraZeneca uses a single strain of a primate adenovirus, so no people have been exposed to it. The Sputnik vaccine uses a mix of two, um, two different uh, adenoviruses that do infect humans. And the reason to use a mix of two is because some people will already have antibodies to one of the types. So using two is, in is in increasing the chances to become very high that one of the two is going to be effective. In general, the institute that developed it and so on has a history of a uh, De developing vaccines and so on. I'm I'm from Russia. I was vaccinated as a child, and I think I think these vac okay. these vaccines are fine. So again, no no concerns that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. I think this one um, is for you, Professor Barbash, which is um, there are a few studies that demonstrated that people with Down syndrome have more severe severe disease, COVID nineteen disease, and higher mortality. In Israel, are they in the group that will receive the vaccines with priority? Um, children are not yet uh, vaccinated at all in Israel. Uh, those who are above the age, like 16 years old, are in the vulnerable group with comorbidities and will be vaccinated earlier, of course. Okay, then I think this question is very important. Someone is asking, uh, should different vaccines be taken? Can I take the Moderna and then the Oxford and then the Pfizer? Uh, the short yeah. answer is no. Okay. Yes, yeah, very important. I think we should only get one. Okay. Then um, is how safe is the CanSino vaccine? That's a vaccine we will probably get for Mexico. So I think Cancino is the same idea as Oxford and, and Sputnik. Uh, again, I haven't seen any specific data about it, but it does use the same, uh, the same technology. And so there isn't a particular reason of concern, but also I, I, don't, I don't have any information about it. Okay, um, Anna Fleeser from Mexico is asking, there was, there was no consensus on the duration of immunity generated by the vaccine between both speakers. How can you know that it will last several years if coronavirus is quite a young virus in the history of the human immune system. We do not know. We will have to wait and see. And hopefully it will last for a few years, but for now on we have only um, evidence for a few months. So we will have to wait. Okay, I think this is the last question from Benny Weiss. Uh, can the DNA vaccines affect the normal DNA, uh, DNA material from the host? Where does the DNA locate itself? Just jump. So, so, so in, in, in the adenovirus, it doesn't integrate into, into the genome. It remains in the capsid. 
and the other vaccines are also generally based. So the, the inactivated virus, it's an RNA virus, so that also will not insert itself into the DNA. And in, in general, all the vaccines that are being developed are uh, take extra care not to insert any genetic material into our cells because that genetic material will, will, will stay there. So um, generally, the, with, with not, none of the technologies, is there any particular concern about changing our own DNA or you know, retaining uh, the DNA of the vaccine in the body for more than a few days. Okay, and as a last, last question, uh, how do you know vaccines are working? How do you, can you measure the immunity that people are getting after vaccination? So, so people take, so already in Israel, there are people taking uh, uh, blood samples, both in, 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 in the hospitals in Israel and here at the Weizmann, actually, there is also a trial. So whoever was, was vaccinated here in the area, I gave blood uh, last week and next week I'll know. So people can, can see what kind of immunity is developing in the blood, compare that to the results of the Pfizer vaccine. And in parallel, uh, there are, people are, are following closely, in particularly what percentage of the severely ill people in the population are over 60 or have been vaccinated. And this will also give in the very near future, uh, in, in, within weeks, we should know uh, approximately how effective are vaccines outside of the trial in the, in the real world. So that data is and coming like, very soon. Thank you. And I would like to stress why we should be following the, the measures about using face masks and social distancing, uh, even though we get vaccinated. I think it's very important to make that clear that we should still be, and why we should still be taking care of ourselves even if we got the vaccines. So the reason, the, the reason is, very, is very important to mention, you're right. We do know, and I repeat what I, what I said earlier, we do know that the vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna and all others are preventing people from getting disease, the COVID-19 disease. We haven't measured whether they, allow them, despite having not having disease, to be infected by the virus in the upper airway. And if that is true, and it also in, it only prevent the disease and not the infection, then these people may get the infected by the virus and get in, and infect other people with it. That's why we need to carry on the masks until we know if in addition to preventing disease, it also prevents transmission and infection in the upper airways. We do not know yet yet. Perfect. I think that's a very important takeaway. I want to thank both of you for your answers. And if anyone has more questions, I don't know if, if they can send them so, so you can address them in the future. Uh, Dani, if you want to take over, thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time to bring this fascinating discussion to an end. Again, I would like to thank you all for being here and also to thank Professor Royosedi, Professor Barabash, Professor Ulitsky for their important insights. Wishing everyone the best of health and a great day. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs>